Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Geek Authority and Wholesalers Distribution Show. And today we have a very special guest, and I'm going to let Mary Lee introduce. Hi, everybody. I'd like to present a friend, an actress, a wonderful person, Miss Elizabeth Grayson. Thank Hi. you for joining our show. Thank you for inviting me. Nice to see your faces. Thanks. Tell you, she's gorgeous. She's beautiful. She's talented. Let's talk it's about so it. <laughs> <laughs> a former Miss America. Oh my God! Mm. Now you're digging back. <laughs> Can we talk about that a little? Tell us about that. About the Miss America stuff. Oh my gosh. Um, well, that was a long time ago. I was um, crowned in. 1981, but I was Miss America in 1982. Um, and I, I haven't, until recently, I had not been involved with that world uh, for, gosh, almost 30 years. And then I had this unusual um, invitation that just popped up from a former Miss America who said, oh, all the formers are getting together to do a rendezvous up in the wine country. Would you like to come? And I thought about it for a while because I had, at that point, I had no real desire to go back to Atlantic City to witness any of that. But I thought, well, that might be kind of interesting to be stuck in a house with, you know, 30 former Miss Americas over a weekend and let's just see what happens. And uh, it turned out to be this amazing weekend and I sort of dipped my toe back into that world and consequently, um, Lee Merriweather, who was the first televised Miss America in 1955, um, she was at the event and I met her and spent a lot of time talking to her. And by the end of that summer, I think that was um, late, late winter when we did that, by the end of that summer, I was doing interviews with Lee Merriweather and I've been working on a documentary about her now for, gosh, almost three years. So, and I've kind of, you know, I did go back to Atlantic City because I wanted to shoot footage of Lee there on the beach and I got some great footage and talked to some formers who really know her and um, you know they've got they've had a lot of turmoil within that organization and it's still it's approaching its 100th year um, but um, I, I'm kind of on the fence about how I feel about it I thought thought the organization was going to really evolve into something that was less Barbie doll like and more um, based on uh, intellect not all the women are very intelligent I'm not saying they're not but um I just I was not a, a supporter of the old system so much um so we'll see what happens if it makes it past 100 years but it it was an interesting year for me I was from our I'm from Arkansas and I'd spent I'd been on like an airplane twice in my life before I went to Atlantic City and then all of a sudden I win and I'm traveling across the United States about 200,000 miles during that year and uh, I mean, it, it changed my life because I used the scholarship money to move to New York and study acting and study photography and- um, You remember, do you remember the crown? You being given the crown? Oh yeah. I mean, that's the only part of the pageant I'll watch again. <laughs> I like the winning part. <laughs> Just cut to the end where I get the, yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. That's gotta be yeah. thrilling for you. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. It's, it's a wild thing. I, they don't have the runway anymore. It's a very different thing now, but- um, what do you do when you travel? What do you do as you, do you go speak to people or what do you do? Well, back in those days, um, the pageant was sort of a big deal. It pulled a lot of ratings and, you know, it was a big deal in the eighties. Um, and they had huge sponsors like Gillette, Kellogg and Nestle were the big sponsors. So you're sort of hired the year before they even know who you are. Um, so you're booked, you know, solidly. Every other day I was on an airplane going somewhere and it was no rhyme or reason. I could be in Alaska, then Puerto Rico, you know, just all over the place. So you, you, um, you go to big conventions for these uh, big uh, sponsors. You go to grocery stores and sign autographs. Um, and then I did a lot of local and state pageants. You just appear and sort of support that system. But um, I'm trying to think what else I did. Did the USO, uh, was one of the last USO troops that traveled. We went to Turkey and Greece at the end of the year. So it was, it was an interesting year. Um, I don't know that I would encourage anyone to do it, but I, but I think it's a very different world now. The, the sponsors aren't there, unfortunately, and it's sort of, an outdated concept that um, I think if they updated it and sort of brought it into this century, then it might have some legs still, but no pun intended, but um, who knows? Yeah. And I remember when I was young, we used to look forward to the, to the past. That was a big deal. Oh, yeah. 
who was the host? They had a couple of hosts, but the... Uh, well, I, I had uh, Ron Ely. He was a Tarzan. But yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh, Burt Parks is the most famous one. Yeah, that's the one I remember. Maybe I'm yeah. old. Yeah, I've met him. I met him at one time, but I, he wasn't there that year to sing the song to me, but... Okay. And let's, let's give the audience a little bit. How, how did you meet um, Mary Lee? How did you guys connect <laughs> first time? Uh, well, we, I'm, I'm a dealer. There's no secret there. And, uh, we did contact work with David Spanzer and, uh, finally became the other Highlander store. And I would go to the events and Elizabeth was there and we, we started talking. I think they walked you guys through the dealer's room late one night at one of the shows. And do you remember, do you remember which show that was? I mean, because I, I think it was one of Christmases. Um, one of the promoters who did a lot of stuff, she did one in Denver. Uh -huh. And I think it was that one that we... So long ago, right? We've known each other. Yeah, gosh. Yes, yes. Well, so. okay. My turn. Now, I did, wasn't aware of this until I, I was, did my own research. And Elizabeth and I had worked together on basically two different sides of a fence. I worked on the pr production side, um, Second Second AD, and she was an actress in a movie called Mark for Death, starring Steven Seagal, directed by Dwight Little. And Loved him. Hell, and I remember escorting her to the set several times. So. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's, uh, that's like a, gosh, both of these events are like so far in my history. It's, hard, it's like a dream, you know, remembering all of that. And that was kind of a nightmare a little bit. <laughs> Mark for Death. Do you remember the locations? We're all over in a, in a warehouse in downtown. And um, yeah. we did by the docks. Um, I don't know if you were at that no, I was mainly being attacked by Rastafarians in the uh, house. The drug dealers, yep. Shot in the drug <laughs> oh, I did a lot of crying and screaming and running for my life and dodging Steven Seagal. <laughs> <laughs> even, even though he was my brother, he was, well, that's a whole other story. We won't go into that. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> but anyway, so that's, that's our all connection. So it's really cool to even have you here. It's so exciting. Um, but you're probably most known for Highlander. Hmm. So you want to tell us about that, uh, getting into that and getting that? Um, how, did, how did you get on it? I never really heard that story. You know, I did, um, I think a couple of years before I was cast in Highlander, I did uh, The Death of the Incredible Hulk with Bill Bixby. Love and, that movie. Uh, yeah. Made yeah. for TV movie, right? Yeah, yeah, it was fantastic. It was kind of a big break for me at the time. It was a good, good character for me and... Bill was so supportive. Um, and I believe, I'm not absolutely sure, but I believe that some of the producers on that show were somehow connected with Highlander, especially in the early days. Uh, they weren't the producers on the show, but somehow I, I remember the name, somehow it came through that. But I, I literally just got a phone call and, and my manager said, do you want to go to Paris and play a jewel thief who's immortal? And I'm like, yeah, of course I do. And yeah, so um, I went. So I didn't even have to audition for that, which are the best jobs. And um, went over there and it was just supposed to be a one-off type of thing. And uh, Adrian and I clicked and I clicked with the character and the writers liked it. And I guess in the end, that was the early days, but the fans really liked that character as sort of a counterpart to McLeod, who was this big hero, and I was sort of amoral slightly um, and very mischievous. Um, and the fans liked her, so they brought me back and then just kept bringing me back and bringing me back. And then I actually had left Los Angeles um, toward the end of the Highlander uh, run, and I'd moved back to Arkansas. I was painting a lot, and I had a studio, and I was sort of concentrating on that, and I got a call that they created Highlander the Raven, so I did that for a year, and um, I've always, I always tell everybody it's the best job I've ever, ever had. I mean, not only were the locations in Canada and in France just spectacular, but um, those, the, the crew, the people I worked with on that show are still my friends, and um, I consider them family, and I think we all feel that way about each other, and that's a really right. unique experience. And it's so strange because back in those days, it a, a, was a franchised show. So either you found it somewhere in your programming on television uh, and loved it, or you were addicted to it, or you know, a total crazy person about it, or 
you'd never heard of it. So still to this day, I'll meet people who are just diehard fans who'll see me at a gas station, especially since my hair's short again. They'll go like, you were Amanda, you know, just out of the blue. And I think, well, it must be running somewhere for them to remember me somehow. But then then people were like, I don't know what Highl even know what Highlander is. So it's a, you know. Or it's on their shelves or the Blu-rays on their shelves at home and they're watching you. That's right, yeah. maybe. <laughs> comfort food. I call those kind of serious comfort food because you've oh, been when you want and and yeah. especially now we've had a lot of time to catch up on on stuff. A lot of binge but watching this year. I gotta ask the playing that kind of character though, isn't it kind of juicy and fun to be a little bit you call it mischievous or some might call it a little bit evil, a little bit nasty. But isn't that like one of the best better roles to play? Oh, the ultimate, yeah. I mean you I got all the good lines and we it was one of those circumstances where um, I sort of understood her. I sort of based her a little bit on my grandmother, just somebody who was always stirring the pot and getting everyone into trouble. And, um, and also on, uh, she was a friend at the time, Amanda Donahoe, who did Lair of the White Worm. And I sort of based it on her a little bit as well, um, and just her general personality. And the writers just, I don't know, it was just one of those, um, synchronistic things that it just worked and they they could write it and I understood it and and Adrian and I had um, we just adored each other and we both have a very similar work ethic and we're willing to go the extra mile to learn a tango for the Eiffel Tower you know we were just we would do it so um, she was so much fun to play um, I wish I had been a better uh, sword fighter um, at the time um, you know, they weren't a lot, that was, sorry, my dogs are barking like crazy. <laughs> um, uh, at the time, uh, that was before women like um, Jennifer Garner, you know, were doing Alias and they were really doing the fights. And I wish that they'd had the money and we had the time so I could have really invested in learning to be a really good fighter. I mean, I can kind of fake it, but you know. It looks uh, that good. Was something that, it, it looks yeah, good. It always just looked good. Yeah. It oh, doesn't look good. Looks like you know what you're doing. So don't tell Take your angles, people. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, you mentioned the fans too. Have you had any really fun or unique or special fan experiences? Um, oh, wow. Um, other than the gas station you mentioned? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, did, I never did a lot of the convention circuit that a lot of people do, but I, I did a couple of the bigger ones, which I never, I, it's a little claustrophobic for me. But going to the Highlander events, um, those were incredible because, gosh, when was the last event we had, Mary Lee? Like, well, just a couple of years ago was the last one with Carmel, uh, 2017, I believe. Yeah. So when you go to those, those events, it was just fat. It was lovely to just see sort of fans who've been there since the beginning of the these type of Highlander events and I don't know it's just such a warm um, fun-loving group of people that I don't know you're just always so comfortable and at home and it's the last convention especially was so emotional do you remember that oh one? god just, yeah we kind of realized it was going to be the last one would probably do that big uh, all together and it was incredibly emotional and moving and Stan Kirsch was still alive and it was sort of the last time I can't even say his name without kind of tearing up but um you know it was it was a great a great it's a great fandom and still is I mean we still have you know a lot of people I follow and it's 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 a great group of people to be associated with I feel very, very supportive very supportive very lovely. okay um I did want to talk to you about you know the technical side a little bit if it's okay about acting and directing because you're a director and a writer and all kinds of fun stuff but before I do that, I created this little slideshow I'd like to show you. Um, the images were gratefully given to me by Mary Lee. And if you want to talk about them, I can pause and back them up, whatever you want to do. But maybe uh, she's, she chose these. Uh, let me punch them up here. And boom. We remember Ooh. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Say no more. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I would have been 20... 20 years old, 21, something like that, when I won. I look so much like my mom. Oh, wow. I think I was trying to go very Italian there. Um, is that a press shot, is that a, or is that from a production? Just a friend of mine who was a photographer. She wanted to do shots, and we went to a local boutique, and they gave me a bunch of clothes, and I was just goofing around, kind of. Wow. Cheap. Very stunning shot, though. Oh, thank you. 
Oh, with Sandra Bernard. Yeah. Um, that was a great episode. I can't remember the name of it. Um, oh, I should have looked it up. But uh, and that was she, yeah. Becca. That's uh, Nadia Cameron, who played my mentor on Highlander. We're still really great friends. Uh, this is a fun fact. I don't know, but she and her husband but, uh, live in England, and they both had the virus. They both had COVID. They're doing fine. But um, I was wow. shocked when I heard. So yeah, we we still stay in touch. She's just she and her husband both are just lovely people. And this oh. not that a great shot? It was so much fun doing that. Uh oh. Oh, yes. <laughs> that was a, I can't remember which episode, The Great Chamoli or something, I think that was called. And I he was so, still yeah. me on the wheel. And You're on a wheel? Okay. Yeah, I was stuck oh. on the wheel with him throwing knives at me. So much fun. And we tried to get his hair as big as we could, like Fabio type of thing. And this is one of my favorite episodes because we went back into the 20s. And um, look at that gun. Wow. You've got a great look. You really have a great look. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Oh, you know, I have flapper films and flapper press. I mean, you know, it's just, part, it's who I am. I think I'm a flapper. If you don't mind me asking, is that, is that your hair? Or is that? That's, no, that's a wig. That's a great oh. wig in the shot. Yeah. I've been a redhead though. I've been every color in the world, but that's, yeah. <laughs> that's a wig. I remember um, stripping the gears on a um, double clutch, uh, what do you call it? Uh, the old fashioned car, getaway car. And, and that's, that's. Oh your, yeah. The the tea, oh the tea God, that you God were driving. Was in, he hated me so much because I, uh, I mean, we had to run around the corner, get in the thing and just, you know, tear off like we're, you know, robbing a bank. And I, they didn't tell me it was double clutch. They didn't tell me anything. And I, they could just hear me going, and I could see them running behind the car, like, stop, please stop. <laughs> my car. Um, uh, well, this is just goofing around. Um, I think the finale, one of the seasons, and that yes. you can see that the Eiffel Tower is behind us. So that's sort of our typical relationship right there. That's me and Adrian for sure. There oh. she is. There yeah, she is. I'm in my laced up bodice thing. Um, yeah. Oh, immor immortality is a bitch. Now I have not seen that byline. That's oh. oh yeah. This is the one <laughs> that they did in Europe. Oh yeah. Wow. <laughs> that says it all then, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh oh. Uh, that is an illustration by Luca Di Napoli, who was the illustrator for my um, young adult fantasy called Shalili. And that is Fippa the Shalili right there. She's and caged, she's caged um, in an uh, alternate universe. Uh, she's transformed from a, um, a young mystic in archaic Greece, and she goes through a portal and is transformed into this Shalili, this sort of fairy girl. And um, she sold at auction to the one man that she's come to rescue to bring back into the real world. And that's what she looks like in her wow. little cage. Isn't she great? She's, she's such a great illustrator. Uh, the book, when I printed it, when I, I self-published this book um, about five years ago, and uh, the book, I couldn't afford to print them in color. But if you order it online at Amazon, you, get, you see the color pictures, and they're really lovely. He's, he's a fantastic artist. And it's for young adults, you said? Yes, yes, it's a young adult fantasy. Um, maybe we'll see it as a Disney movie. Maybe, maybe. You know, <laughs> what, if I was, no, I don't think so. But what I was uh, <laughs> thinking about doing is an audio book, and I was going to try to get Lee Merriweather to do some of the, the recording. So I don't know, but I don't know. It's not high on the list of things to do at the moment, but it's on the list at least. This photo, interestingly enough, was taken by my friend Kathleen Kinmont, who's an actress and writer, and she was on. I met her when I did a double episode of Renegade way back in the day. And we've stayed friends through the years and she's a great photographer. She's actually helped shoot a couple of my first uh, films, short films that I did. And that's one of her headshots of me. And I took some of her after she took them of me. Oh, that's the last of those. Mary, well, thank oh, you. That was kind of fun. Yeah. I told you she's gorgeous. I told you she's a gorgeous oh. lady. <laughs> um, okay, um, I'm just uh, curious and, and a lot of people who you know, obviously watch shows or, uh, you know, the franchises that are out there and you're part of one. Um, what's a typical, for, as it, from the acting standpoint, what's a typical day for you like as an actor? You know, you get your name on the call sheet, your call time's, what, probably early for makeup and hair. But what's, what's that like, if you can talk a couple minutes about that? Wow. Uh, well, Highlander was unique in that we shot half of the year in Canada and half of the year in France. Um, because it was a co-production. So 
um, in in Canada and Vancouver, and then uh, the Raven was in Toronto. That's sort of a regular day, getting up about 5 a.m. and going into the works if you're working that day. Um, but but France is a very different prospect because we seldom shot in Paris, even though that's where we our hotel was, that's where we lived. Um, but we usually shot like castles and locations outside of the city. So we would get up at, oh gosh, three o'clock in the morning. I mean, I would try to get up at three in the morning to just kind of, I would soak in a bath, I remember, just to kind of gradually wake up. And because it was cold in the winter, that's when we shot there. And then they pick you up like at, I don't know, four in the morning and you fall asleep in the van until you get there, which is like an hour or so away. And you get up and you just go through the works, through makeup, through hair, through wardrobe, and you shoot all day, you have a big lunch and shoot some more and then get back in the van and drive back. It was, the days were really, really long. Uh, it was fine because you could kind of wind down on the way back, but um, not a lot of time to do much uh, other than work until the weekend and then we'd all hang out together. But um, yeah, that the getting up in the, that early is a little rough, but it's a champagne problem. <laughs> <It's> a, <laughs> not that bad. Like, um, they're like 12 15 hour days is that what yeah yeah i think when we started shooting the raven i remember um we had not signed my contract at the beginning and i was already shooting and at that point the hours were even longer than that and i was just cross-eyed because we'd started working our day started in the evening so we were doing night shoots to start and i mean long days just unbelievable and we finally, thank God I didn't sign my contract because we were able to negotiate the hours all of a sudden when I could see what was happening that, you know, 16 hour days, it was like, I can't function. You will, you will not have a start of your series if I, you know, at one point I said, I feel like I'm growing a unicorn horn from my head. I'm so tired. <laughs> they looked at me, like, okay, maybe we should give her a day off. <laughs> so, yeah. So what was it like going on set? Did you have a lot of rehearsing or did you have training? Cause you mentioned the fighting and all that. Yeah, Highlander was unique in that respect as well because um, when you were not shooting more than likely, well, definitely on Raven, not so much on Highlander. I didn't do a lot of fighting on that, but we, like I said, Adrian and I were always doing something. It seems like we were dancing. We were always having to work out something in between everything, but on the Raven, it got to the point where I was doing two fights an episode. So every free moment you get, you're learning a bit of it. Uh, I mean, you'll see uh, there's all sorts of back uh, behind the scenes shots of me, like in heels and a dress, you know, and I'm like running through the moves, just kind of with my, you know, wobbling on my heels with my sword, trying to learn what I was going to be doing the next day. So it was, um, it was, grueling it, it, in kind of a fun way. I mean, that's kind of your exercise and the stunt people um, were amazing and very accommodating and really helpful. And I had terrific uh, doubles. So even though we, you know, they looked very different and were, I think I was probably a good foot taller than most of them. They still made it work and made me look great, you know, but um, yeah, that was, that was, that was hard. That was a hard, hard haul, I would say. Wow. Yeah. How about, uh, let's switch it now, you, uh, for going from the director. How is it for you as a director? What do you, how do you operate? How do you command your set? Um, <laughs> uh, well, you know, after I had a kid, I, um, I had a lot of time there where I kind of did nothing. Well, I, I was finishing up Shalili and sort of did that, but that was very much, you know, at home a lot with my baby. And then by the time she got into um, pre-K, I would have like a three or four hour window trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. Did I want to go back into acting? Did I you know what, what did I want to spend the rest of my life doing? This kind of was that moment in my life. And um, I decided to work on the other side of the camera and start writing. And I, it, um, it was a cool, a wonderful uh, synchronistic uh, uh, event that I met this woman named Hillary Thomas from the Lineage Dance Company in Pasadena. They're a, a modern dance company, a nonprofit that, bring awareness to other charities and sort of have this general mission for bringing the arts to the masses. And I met her at an event and I wanted to, as my foray into directing, I wanted to uh, enter the, um, the AFI Women Directors Contest. So to do that, you had to have a script and you had to, um, you know, present what you were going to do to 
become part of this program. So I contacted Hillary, who I, I just met her, but I said, I have this idea for um, a film where a woman has a stroke and it was based on a dance I'd seen them do. You know, she has a stroke, but it's part of your company. So I had this whole idea and she just said, okay, let's do it. So I ended up shooting her just by herself for a dance to see if I could pull it off. And Kathleen Kinmont was the, the DP on that. And then um, I wrote the script and we, it's called The Perfection of Anna. And um, it was sort of my first big move into this realm. And it was so immediately I felt at home, like, ah, oh, this is, this is what you need to be doing. It was, I don't know if it's because I'm a control freak, it could be, but um, it was a, it was so rewarding to be able to come up with an idea to write it, to plan it out and to execute it and then have it come out. And I was just, it came out exactly like I saw it in my head, which is, you know, what, how often does that happen? And um, since then, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm kind of all over the place because I do a lot of documentary things as well. Um, but I mean, when I think back, even before that, I'd done a, on a, a super high eight camera, you know, the, the sound in the camera, just horrible little camera. But I shot um, these female impersonators in Arkansas in the late, I guess that was the late 90s when I'd moved back to Arkansas, sort of transforming from male to female. It's called The Damn Deal, this video, this documentary. So I don't know. I, I just feel like it's a real extension of my creativity because I, I, li I do a lot of things. I, I write, I paint, you know, and I just, it all seems connected to me and for directing and creating a project. Granted, it takes a long time to put something together, but it seems to ch check off all the boxes in me as a, as an artist. Um, and I don't know, I, I like, I like working with people. Um, and I like, I don't, I just love the process of, of creating something like that, where you're, it's a collaboration but there's a vision involved, but you're open to someone else's input. It's just very rewarding for me. And um, I'm trying, the project, uh, I've got a couple of things working right now. Of course, the Lee Merriweather documentary, but um, I have a project called the Gen Z Collective that I have several partners on, but we started interviewing young people at the first Women's March in Los Angeles, right when Trump was, uh, when he came to office. And I started um, asking uh, young people, you know, why they were protesting and what, you know, they thought about the world, what their hopes and fears are, you know, for the future and what they intend to do to make the world a better place. So since that time, I've interviewed, oh, 200 or more young people all across the United States in sit down interviews and at various marches and protests. And now we have a library of oh, I'm gonna say 300 short films that uh, we launched in January. It's called the Gen Z Collective.com and you can go, it's for, for Gen Z. It's not necessarily about them. I mean, you learn about them by watching their, their videos, but uh, it's just them talking about the world. And um, we created this website, which is all the films we release two, two a week uh, on that platform and on our Instagram and YouTube and all the other socials. Um, but it's also a database because as we were finding, as we were searching everything, we saw that there's so much information. There's a lot of resources out there for young people for a variety of things, whether you're interested in how to participate in a march for, you know, the cli a climate strike, for instance, or if you're depressed or if you're, you know, you're anxious, you know, where do I go to get answers if I need somebody to help me right now? So we were creating this massive database that is sort of a hub to, uh, for the young people to come and connect with other people and maybe organize if they want to. But also there's a big find help section which just covers everything from you know um, college applications to anxiety to uh, nuclear war, you know, whatever they need. But we're trying to just consolidate it to where it's easy to find very quickly. So it's been an incredibly rewarding experience and we're constantly adding new films to the to the mix like uh well all the black lives matter marches we added like 20 films last month alone and now we're starting to accept submissions from young people either iphone videos or you know music or poetry or you know however they express themselves writing um so we're starting to receive all that and we're trying to put it into i'm trying to um find some a, a bigger platform
own because there's only so much I can do with that website, at least at this point. I have visions of it going somewhere bigger to where we have like a 30 minute episodic show that's narrated by young people. It's for young people, gets them inspired. It's kind of akin to um, John Krasinski's Some Good News. I don't know if you saw any of that. Something like that meets the their sort of kick-ass activism, you know, this TikTok generation. So I just, I feel such a calling to help them. I have a teenage daughter, so she's smack dab in the middle of Gen Z. And, um, you know, we've left them a really crappy world and it's, they're going to need all the help they can get. So I'm determined, as are many of my partners on this, to just help them as much as we can and just give them a big soapbox to just shout it out and inspire each other and keep moving forward in a positive way. So that's, it's a real passion project for me right at the moment. That sounds incredible. Um, you mentioned your daughter. Is she, uh, is she also in the business or is she? She's in the business of being a snarky teenager. <laughs> <laughs> no, she's great. No, 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 no. She's um, no, she doesn't have the performance bug. She's got other things going on. She plays the electric bass. She's just formed a, a band with some of wow. her yeah. are you a musician as well or no um i mean i sing and i play the piano and i was in the band in arkansas in the town i'm from they had a huge music program so i played like the flute and the bassoon and yeah wow. I mean, musically inclined but i don't really pursue it in any way no is there anything you don't do oh darling <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing wow um my next question was, so what are you working and what are you doing now? I'm like, you just <laughs> check. <laughs> yeah, I need to get off my butt and finish uh, Ms. Merriweather is what that film is called. It's, uh, you know, documentaries. I thought that was going to be a short, short film, like a really short film that just was sort of a kiss to Lee Merriweather. But then I started acquiring all the archive. Where's it going? Where's it going to go? Um, it you know, it's going to be, it's not going to be a long feature. It'll, it'll be at least an hour. I mean, ideally, I'd want it, to, you know, just to sell it to somebody, PBS or Netflix or anybody like that. Um, it's it's very much a love letter to her. It's not, she's just such a unique person in that she is good as gold, just one of those people. And yeah, I've, I've met her at several conventions, so she's been really, really she's nice. She's a spectacular person. Is she working with you? Is she helping you? Oh, well, her daughters have been instrumental. Yeah, I mean, I've I've interviewed her extensively. And then her daughters have helped me along the way, and I've one, talked. One to of her daughters. Her. One of her daughters is stunt woman, isn't Lovely. she? Lovely. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Amazing, amazing stunt woman. Yeah. Um, it's um, it's been interesting because she was such an icon in the '70s. It's such a television icon, and um, of course, the Miss America people all love her. She's kind of the quintessential Miss America. If you were going to like have a stereotype, that's it, because she's just so open and warm and loving and. I mean, in the end, it's like, why are you making this film? And it's like, well, because the world needs more people like her. She is a true role model of what it's like to be a decent, kind, loving human being. And that's, right. that's the example we need. And I just want to honor that in her because it is, it's a beautiful and, thing. And no disrespect to Julie Newmar, Eartha Kitt, but she was my favorite Catwoman. Oh, I so. love that. I love that. Such a uh, sexy Catwoman. She was fantastic. Yeah, the, her whole movement and everything. Yeah, I loved them all, but she was she was my uh, my favorite. Yeah, I'm partial uh, too. Well, um, anything you want to tell your fans uh, in closing about uh, either what you're doing or to them? Um, well, go to flapperpress.com. Uh, when I when I published Shalili, I had to you know set up a website as a author's website, and that has transformed over the years and now I have it's sort of an online magazine a blog portal and I have writers from all over the world contributing and um, we've only been doing it a little over a year but um, we have a lot of content it's very uplifting our byline is useful words inspiring stories and eclectic perspectives so it kind of covers all these bases um, we have everything from um, science pieces, television history, to tarot scopes, astrology, numerology, uh, recipes, travel. It's, it's a lot of fun. So please, you know, go to Flapper. Well, any links you want me to include, we'll, we'll put them in the, okay. Okay. Put them below. below. Mm -hmm. Everybody can uh, click on them. But um, just want to say thank you so much for, for spending the time with us. Uh, you're beautiful. Really appreciate you're, amazing, it. you're talented. You're, you're, Clearly, you're busy, uh, which is a, which is a good thing. And, Thank you for, for wanting to talk to me. I appreciate it. And no all I would say to everyone is 
be safe, wear a mask, social distance, take care of each yeah. other. Yeah, Please, yeah. absolutely. Definitely. Yeah. So I want to thank our audience for uh, joining us. Um, we'll have uh, new shows every week. Um, keep in touch. Uh, be sure to uh, like and subscribe. And Mary Lee, turn on the bell notification at the bottom. You know everything. As you can see, we've got uh, links here and all over to to join. Um, I tell you, it was Elizabeth. It was amazing having you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Thanks. You stay safe and keep an eye on that daughter and uh, <laughs> let us know when the lead comes out. I definitely want to see that. So. Oh, yes, I'll definitely tell you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Take care. You too. Thank you. Thanks everybody for watching. Bye. Bye.